<laughs> and it is just smiling at me. So. You've been smiling so, at me since last January. I have been smiling at you since last January. <laughs> Hi, my name is Monica Wood. Most people know me as the author of a few novels and a memoir. But I'm now a playwright because I have a play called Paper Maker that is shortly going to be up on the main stage at Portland Stage Company which is a dream come true for me because I have seen just about every show they've ever done for the last 30 years or however long. When they were profile theater, I used to go at the old bagel place down on Temple Street. <laughs> so I've seen it all. And uh, I have a, a kind of awe for the theater. I've been in love with the theater since I was 12 years old and my sister Anne, my older sister, um, who was my high school English teacher, um, took her three baby sisters to see a uh, production of The Merchant of Venice in Stratford, Connecticut. I have complete awe of actors and I've always kind of secretly wanted to write a play, but that's not where my writing path took me. So what happened was, this all happened in turbo charge time, I'm told. Um, and it's the only, I have to say, you know, it's not easy being, a writer is not an easy path to be a professional novelist, uh, but this all happened like that which was a uh, shock to me and probably a shock to everybody else. But um, I was on tour for my last book, was a mem it's a, which is a memoir called When We Were the Kennedys. The subtitle is A Memoir from Mexico, Maine. And it tells the story of 1963, when I was nine years old, growing up in Mexico, Maine, which is a mill town in the western foothills. And um, it, it twines three stories. One is the day that my father died. I was nine years old. He was on his way into the mill. He worked in the wood yard at the Oxford Paper Company, it was called then. Uh, and it's about what happens to the Wood family in that first fatherless year. And it also twines two other stories, which is that it was also the year of the Kennedy assassination. And it was also the year where both towns, Rumford and Mexico, twin towns, were bracing for a protracted labor strike that would change the relationship between the mill and the town forevermore. And it was um, kind of a uh, writ small, but um, a symbol for what was happening all across America at that time. And I consider it the beginning of the long decline of manufacturing in this country. 19... 50s and 60s and 70s were really good years for the main paper industry. Um, there was a huge demand for the product, the paper. We had raw materials close by, pulp. Um, environmental laws were pretty lax. You could float logs in the river and, you know, throw all your garbage into the river and into the air. Um, you had a lot of baby boomers who were um, healthy and young and vigorous, wanted to work. Um, not much international competition. World War II took care of that. Uh, you didn't have to worry about getting paper products from the Soviet Union or Finland or any of the places where it comes from now. Um, and, um, and, and cheap energy, because we were on the rivers, so on the water. And so the towns uh, grew and prospered. Uh, where there was a paper mill, which was the best job you could get, you know, union jobs, uh, paid well. And um, everybody knew each other. So, uh, so the good news was that the pay was great. Uh, the highest uh, per capita income in Maine was Millinocket. It wasn't Cape Elizabeth or Falmouth, it was Millinocket. Um, and everybody had a job. And uh, you were kind of born into the job. Your father and your grandfather worked in the mill. That's the way it was, and it's, that's where you worked, and it was great. And, and, but it was also sort of isolated. And so if you were in Rumford or Livermore Falls or Jay or uh, certainly Millinocket, East Millinocket, Lincoln, uh, Madawaska, any of these towns, real paper mill towns, uh, Baileyville, um, were real paper mill communities and they were prosperous and they were an essential part of Maine's economy. Um, it wasn't just the mill, obviously it was the pulp and paper products, the you know, people who cut the wood and hauled it and the restaurants and, and, it, was, it, and it was very, very um, vibrant communities. And when I went on tour for this book that I thought was going to have no resonance at all beyond the borders of Oxford County, Maine, honestly. Um, I went coast to coast twice. I went all over the place talking to people about this book. And the response was so 
amazing because you, I'd get, I still get mail every day, literally, mm -hmm. from people in Illinois, Georgia, mm -hmm. Minnesota, and they'll say, well, we used to have a town like that. We made buttons. We made uh, buckles. We made shirts. We, we were an oil town, steel town, coal town, and it's gone. So people see it as uh, not just a personal story of loss, but also a story about the American middle class and what happened. Today, all of this is gone. There's international competition. The energy prices are high. Uh, there's a huge drop in the demand for paper. We 7% drop in paper every year. Why? Because we use email and uh, we don't read newspapers anymore. Um, uh, the, the workforce is aging. You, you don't have a lot of young people in these communities. People would get educated and they get up and they'd leave even though it's a great way but you go to the university and off you go and you generally would not come back. Uh, so all of these issues have changed. So this didn't happen all at once. So we go from the 60s, uh, the 50s and 60s where there's money being made and it's exciting and it's just this community to now when all of this is pretty much gone. Um, we still have a few mills, thank goodness, but we lost, we just recently lost our Bucksport mill. I mean, and, and so um, when did this happen? When did this start to change? Well, it starts to change in the 1970s, and the corporate owners of the mills started to say, well, we're not making the profits we used to. Um, all these environmental laws, we can't float the logs anymore, and, uh, and, and there's international competition, we have to pay attention to that now. So all of these things start to squeeze profits. And so the corporate owners, none of whom are in Maine, start to say, well, we have to change this. And so they start squeezing, and they start trying to speed up the machines, they try to change the union rules, they say, this isn't going to work anymore. Um, we're not just going to hire you because your father and your grandfather worked here. We need people with a little more education or a little bit different perspective. And so the squeeze starts to happen. And by the time you get to the late 70s and the early 1980s, this is when you have the maximum amount of time for labor strife in, in Maine's paper industry. Because if you're local, you don't see the change. You say, why won't you hire my son? My, you know, I worked here, my dad worked here. And why are you changing the rules? I don't understand this. And with legitimacy, I mean, where's it? these decisions are coming from far, far away. The owner of the mill is not local, not from Maine. You don't know who they are. And in a sense, this starts to become, if you think about it, a metaphor for industrial America. Because it's, we're talking about the paper industry, but it happens in industry after industry after industry. The same thing happens over and over and over again. Ownership goes from the families who started uh, who actually started the mills and owned the mills to uh, to investor holding companies and now of course hedge funds and so as ownership disappears manufacturing goes down uh, and this is where you start to get the income disparity if you look at the chart up until 1982 uh, you had kind of a steady line between uh, you know what percentage of Americans had you know were in the top 1% or the top 5% and then all of a sudden this graph takes off like a rocket and is still going up so that the people who are making money are making money in far far greater proportion to people who aren't. In other words, there's a gap. I mean, Americans like people getting rich. I mean, there's no problem with that particularly. We elect Rockefellers to public office. I mean, it's not particularly, it's not like we're a particularly country who doesn't value wealth, but the gap becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And for the people who can't get into the 1%, it also becomes more and more difficult to change your life. So you work and you work and you work and you work and somehow it just doesn't get better. Um, and then we get into uh, we get into some of our situations of you know who do you trust? You use Millinocket had a big uh, you know the ownership was not in Maine, but a lot of the very top people at Great Northern Paper Company, I, and I met a number of them when I was Attorney General, uh, had all gone to the University of Maine, uh, had at Pulp and Paper Technology School. They had gone through a rotation several times as they worked their way up the company. They were company men, they'd been there, and they're all men, of course, and they'd, and they'd uh, been there their whole lives. And so, yeah, I was in Millinocket for two years, and then I got transferred out, and then I came back for another five years. And so they were probably, you knew who they were, and you know, there aren't, look, let's face it, there aren't that many places to eat in Millinocket, so, or go to church, and so you would rub shoulders with people who were your bosses and who were pretty senior executives. It was not that unusual. Um, but again, that's the that's, we're talking here the 70s and the 80s and the time when the strife would happen. And so then you would say to yourself, if you were a mill worker and the squeeze starts to come on, 
you know, how could Harry have done that to me? How could Garrett have done that to me? We, you know, we, we, you know, we, we went to the St. Hyacinth's together in Westbrook or something. I mean, you knew, you knew these people and their kids were in school with you. It was, how, why would they do such a thing? In those days, unlike in this, you know, the, the Portland area, the future for any, any resident of Rumford wasn't to go to college or the university, working in the mill. That provided them the security, longevity, and all those things that are so important to them back in those days. Because when I was there, many of the kids' parents were second, third, and fourth generation. They knew it, knew, knew other, other work. I mean, my aunt, I had an aunt who, who, who earned a living preparing meals back for, for employees that my cousin would deliver at noontime, bring baskets down to the workers. She charged them a dollar a day or something for it. Huge income. Everything was centered around the mill. I think what you do best and what I think really comes out in the play is your ability to write dialogue. Mm. And each of those characters is so specific and they're written from a point of view and a perspective that for an actor it's gold. Mm. Mm. You, you mm. really see who these characters are. And when I read the play, that was what really shone through to me. And I could see that here are people that are real and they're living in Maine and they're living in an area, in a rural area in Maine and the voices were great and specific, and I felt that mm. I was seeing real people that were up there, not mm. just somebody's description or thinking about who somebody was. And that really carried a lot of importance to me when I was looking at why would I want to do this play at all. Because mm. I, it, mm. it was really interesting to have a play that really presented the point of view, the perspective of people in our community and people that so often, people that so often are voiceless and that mm. don't have a way of getting their story out. And Monica was so able mm. to mm. present their point of view and their perspective. And not mm. just from one side, it's management and it's the union workers. It's the guy who's good across the picket line and it's the mother who's just trying to take care of her son. So you're seeing everybody's side in this mm. and you don't walk away feeling like there's a right and a wrong, there's a black and a white. Mm. And I think there's real beauty in that, especially in this country that we're living in right now where there is, there's red and there's blue. <coughs> and, and people do try to make it um, one way or another. And with this, it really creates and opens the opportunity for dialogue. And that's what we've been finding as we've been reaching out into the community that people really do want to talk about this, that people really are interested in the two mains. What does it mean to be living in a place where the industry has disappeared and there's a whole group of people that are hurting and are trying to find a new way. And what does that mean when you live in a city and you never, never knew anything about that? And what can we learn about each other and hopefully bring our state more closely together, mm -hmm. bring our state closer together and develop relationships and start a dialogue happening that may lead to results. You know, one of the loveliest things that somebody said to me after the memoir came out uh, was, and it was a young person, she was maybe 23 years old, and it was right after the Hostess factory in, had closed, it was a big story at the time, it was about a year ago now, I think, and she said, before I read your book, I never would have thought twice about the families who just lost their livelihood. And I thought, wow, okay, that's why I wrote the book. You know, one of the many reasons mm -hmm. I wrote the book. And it was funny when I was touring, you know, like if I'm in California, for, say, um, there were certain doors people could open to, to the book. Any family story, you can do that. You could say, oh, well, I also grew up Catholic, or we also had a you know, mentally challenged sibling in our family, or um, uh, you know, we also had, lived in a factory town, or I remember the nuns, or something like that. But it was funny in Maine, you would think that every Maine audience would understand completely that I had, didn't have to explain anything, which by and large I didn't. But when I realized when I was in certain communities in Maine, what they would say to me is, you know, I never knew anything about what I would call inland, rural, industrial Maine. And that's a different Maine that it's, it, it, even the way those towns were founded, they were founded on immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. And the coastal towns, they're more the seafaring Yankee English sensibility. And then you go inland and you have all these um, cultural differences mm -hmm. with the way people cook and talk. And you know, when I was growing up, there were a lot of languages. I mean, there were grandparents of 
of my friends who didn't speak English. They spoke French or Italian or Lithuanian. And uh, it's just a very different experience that even people in Maine, because we have such a geographically huge state, did not really know that much about that part mm -hmm. of Maine. So it's been really interesting. I've had a, a great affection for the paper industry since so, you know, I worked in the paper mill and so I kind of knew the lingo and, and uh, the culture, if you will, as a member of a union and uh, the brotherhood of pulp sulfite and paper mill workers. I mean, it was great and I remember it. I made good money. I made enough money then so that I could pay my entire uh, tuition and fees at the University of Maine and I had money left over. I remember I turned back a scholarship because I was so fortunate that I had a job that worked the paper mill. Uh, as opposed to every other job, which would be a minimum wage job, it was a union union job, union protection. It was it was it was a great personal experience. It changed my life uh, in a very positive way. And so, because I could come out of college without debt, which you can't do today, uh, I was able to teach school and go to law school, and so have a family. It, it was some very positive positive results. So when I was growing up, it was the Oxford Paper Company. A few years later, and this is when global competition and all these things started happening, it was bought by the Ethel Corporation, which wasn't a paper company. And then from there it was Ethel, Boise, Cascade, Mead, Mead West Vaco, New Page. But that's, that's the story of American manufacturing. Suddenly it's this kind of family business for 75 years, and then it's this, 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 this and now it's new page and it's about to be something else. Uh, and that's, that's the story of it. And I think what I'm doing in the play is I'm placing Henry as right at the beginning of what he can foresee and what people in town are not quite willing mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. And I, I lived through that. Right. You know, I was in high school when Ethel Corporation bought the mill and I remember when the signs changed, it was just this huge thing. It said Oxford Paper Company for, well, since I was born, that's all I ever remembered. And suddenly it said Ethel Corporation. And even the name was so ugly. How's it spelled? E-T-H-Y-L. Mm. Oh, yeah. Bad. Um, and then, and that's when things really started to change. The strike for the union was clearly not going well. Uh, these huge international pressures that I, you know, international competition, transportation, bad sources, environmental laws, all these things coming together. It wasn't going well for the union. So one night, I mean, it was, I can remember what it was, it was Christmas Eve, um, the, um, uh, the strike was still going on. And as attorney general, I didn't think it was a, I couldn't like go to the picket line. So uh, there was a, a candlelight uh, service actually, a ceremony, all, everybody lined up outside the mill holding candles, uh, the union members, and a lot of their kids who were doctors, and lawyers, and, come back for the holidays, right? And they're all lined up. With their, and so I said, so I got my car. <laughs> I said, listen, Falls, I went up and I, I just went through the line and shook everybody's hand, wished them Merry Christmas, went over and saw some of the, the strike breakers, went over, shook their hands, went to the security guards, we said Merry Christmas. But you could just feel the pain in the town that night. It was very, very difficult. It was dark. And, um, and, and they kind of knew that the strike was lost. And it wasn't just a strike that was being lost. I mean, everything was being lost. Your whole way of life, your whole culture, uh, your, your, your high school football rivalries were going to lose because there wouldn't be any kids in the schools would have to merge, which is exactly what happened. And so all these sorts of things changed. And, you know, change is part of who we are. I mean, these were big market forces. Um, it would be easy if you were in the union to blame it all on the management and management to blame it on the union and all this sort of stuff. But that really wasn't going on then. And it's certainly, and you look back, it wasn't going on now. But I just tear your heart out to see, to see those, to see that change. It was very painful. Mexico and Rumford now is exactly half of what it used to be. Uh, when I was at the time of the memoir, there were 3,300 employees of the Oxford Paper Company. Now it's between six and 700, depending on whether one of the machines is up. It keeps going up and down. Uh, there were 4,000 people in my town. There are now 2,000. There were, I think, 15,000 in Rumford, and now it's more like you know, 8,000. So it's, uh, and they're not the only ones, of course. It's, that's the story of a lot of towns in Maine. But it, you know, it dwindles because the, not only do the mill jobs end, then, 
you know, there aren't as many teachers and there aren't as many doctors and there aren't as many insurance people and there aren't as many shopkeepers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you look at Congress Street now in Rumford and there are just a couple of little shops and it used to be, you know, all down both sides of the street. There, was, there wasn't a shop that wasn't occupied. So it, it, it's heartbreaking, but that's, that's the way it is. That's what happens when you lose your industry or, or much of your industry. And they're trying, God bless them, they're trying to bring in industry and thinking of creative ways. There are some really amazing people up there, uh, bright, visionary people who are trying their best, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. I don't think there's a simple solution. I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a work in progress. We're trying to explore different options. I know that different development companies have looked at it. The, the state has put some money into Rumford trying to uh, improve some of the old, older buildings, hoping to attract uh, manufacturing, but I'm afraid I'm, the manufacturing basis um, of our state is, is, is I'm not saying it's history, but damn close to it. One thing that I touch upon in the memoir is that the mill itself was my first metaphor. Mm. It was this paternal, godlike entity that could give and take. And uh, I discovered during, you know, you don't start out with theme when you write a book. The theme comes to you as you figure out what you're writing. And I realized that one of the big themes in the book was a parent-child kind of thing. You know, Kennedy dies and the children are weeping. My father dies and literally the children are weeping. There's a, uh, a, a chance that the mill is going to go away and the, the town just doesn't know what to do about that. And so what I've tried to do is I realized writing Papermaker, I didn't start with that, but I ended up with that anyway. Because even though the context of the play is this um, bitter, violent labor strike, the play is about families and family dynamics. And it's interesting that the two major relationships in the play, well, two of the major relationships, are parent-child. Henry, the CEO, has this daughter that he's tr who's trying to connect with him, and it, it mostly does not go well. It's a very uh, embattled relationship. And on the other side, you have Ernie and his son, Jake, who's also a striking paper maker. And there's a very um, heartbreaking difference in how they are coming to see this conflict. So we've got this parent-child thing going on in the dynamics of the human relationships that echo when we were the Kennedys. So it's funny, I think of, um, you know, I've told people, yes, it's based on my book, Ernie's Ark, but honestly, the more I get into this process and the more I tweak the script, I realize that the basis of this book is the memoir, not the fiction. As an audience member, you connect with these real people, with these people that have good things and bad things about them, and that are they're funny and they're frustrating and they're curious and they're serious, and it's all of these different colors that make each of us a human being mm -hmm. instead of just some sort of a caricature of, of a person. And I think Monica really does mm -hmm. that beautifully in the script. And so it, it just lets you get inside, inside of these different people with different perspectives, different points of view. It's not telling you what to think, but it's giving you a lot of different ideas and fodder and a way of looking at the mm -hmm. world maybe in a different way. Well, that's so nice. I remember my sister Kathy one time, she's a huge fan of my novels, and she said, you know, Monty, what I like <laughs> the best about your novels is nobody is just one thing. Mm -hmm. And I love that, It's because no human being is just mm -hmm. one exactly. thing. Well, I would like to invite everybody to come and see Papermaker. I think you will enjoy it. And um, I certainly know I have enjoyed it, and it's the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. So I'd like you to come in and just kind of, I'll probably be at whatever performance you come to, I'll be there. And uh, you know, for like 30 performances, I've got tickets for every single one. And um, come and say hi and let me know what you think, and uh, we'll all have a great time. And it runs. <laughs> oh, and it runs 21st. from April 21st to May 24th.